I was a gymnast for a really long time, like eight years of my life, which is a long time because I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't really that good at it, but it was fun to do and it was really good exercise. Um, something that they taught young gymnasts for a long time is this idea of the center of balance. And the center of balance is something that once you hit it once, you can hit it over and over and over again. And it's the perfect handstand, it's the perfect handspring, it transcends gymnastics, and it's supposed to transform it after you've found it the first time. The center of balance is probably just a clever theory uh, combining muscle memory and center of mass, because it's really just physics anyway. But I searched for it as a gymnast because it was supposed to make you a better athlete, so there was no reason to not keep looking for it. I, however, was a little bit obsessed with balance, like to the point of insignificance where I would never eat an odd number of Skittles at once because I didn't want the two sides of my mouth to be unbalanced. It also manifested in more interesting ways. Um, every time there was systematic imbalance in the world around me that I noticed, I tried to do something to solve it. So in fourth grade, um, we didn't have recycling bins in my school. And in order to dispose of a water bottle properly, we had to like run around the school and go find the one recycling receptacle at the very back of my tiny elementary school campus. Whereas we had trash cans in every classroom and that's not sustainable. So I had no previous activism experience. I was eight um, and <laughs> I had very little fundraising experience either. So I did the only thing I really knew how to do which is ask adults for help. Um, I wrote my school principal a letter asking for recycling education, an environmental club, and more recycling bins. And I thought it was a pretty well-crafted letter, but it was written in pencil on one sheet, on one side of wide rule notebook paper, and had a little colored pencil drawing of a tree on top. So <laughs> in retrospect, it probably wasn't the best idea. Um, however, I passed it around, and I had, by the end of the year, pages and pages of third and fourth graders' signatures. And I turned it in. Um, I don't know what happened because I left the school the next year. But regardless of what happened, I had a lot of support from my peers and also the adults around me. And I realized that I wasn't the only one who was thinking about these imbalances. I just, like, by acting on it, was including lots of other people who wanted the same thing, just hadn't thought about maybe doing something about it yet. So it made me feel like I could make a change in the future even if it didn't work this time. In middle school, I was bitten by the camera bug. Um, I picked up my mom's DSLR, the same one that I still use today, and what I found was something I was somewhat talented at, but mostly just really passionate about. It was a lot of fun, taking pictures is fun. Um, uh, as I like dove into the art of photography, I learned a lot about composition from reading photography books and browsing old, like, famous image directories and whatever to try to get a better idea of what a good picture looked like. One of the ones that I ran into during this time was a photograph by a woman named Sally Mann. It's an image of a young girl, maybe in her early teens, standing in the middle of a road. Um, her left back there is a young boy on stilts and to her right back there is a young girl looking at the boy. The figure herself, the main subject, she is young and lean, and her hair is tangled and free-flowing like that of a child who has been out to play. And her figure is very brightly illuminated and contrasts like, starkly with her dark surroundings. It looks like evening in the photo. But in contrast to all of that, her eyes are tired and hardened, and her expression is tired. And most shockingly of all, in her hands, she seems to balance an unlit cigarette. This photo is Candy Cigarette, it's very famous, and um, the photographer's daughter is the main subject of the photo. Um, the cigarette is a piece of candy, it's not actually unlit, but as just the initial glance, we don't know that, and it, there's a lot of shock value present in this photo. But with further analysis and with the second glance at it, there's multi-layered symbolism. We see presented in this photograph an idea of overtaken innocence and the balance between the fight to stay in childhood and an urgency to move forth, 
as well as a recognition of a parent's relationship with a daughter. Um, I didn't understand all this when I was like 11 or 12 or whenever I read this analysis for the first time and looked at this photo for the first time because the reviews used a lot of big words and existential list vocabulary that I didn't really have a grasp of. But what I did get from it was the simplest of messages that every time a photograph was taken, uh, messages would be sent through it. Whether or not they're deliberately composed is up to the photographer. And since I had that ability to send viewers explicit messages that I want them to see, I might as well deliberately compose what they are. So at this point, I'd already realized that my idea of like a world in balance was going to manifest through activism, like to actively search for this balance. And my discovery of photography as a personal passion was symbolic, like it, it was a way to, to incorporate symbolism into activism to make it more effective. Um, and one way that all three of these things were extremely relevant to my life was through feminism. Um, so the most basic definition of feminism is the movement for the equality of genders. Uh, this equality is social and political and economic. It incorporates all ages, all races, all genders, all classes, all sexualities. <coughs> feminism is for everyone. And simply, like simply put, it is all-encompassing. It crosses into other movements as well. It uh, holds hands with dispelling racism and dispelling classism. Um, the details of exactly what feminism is change as you move from movement to movement and individual to individual. Like, some people will talk about the patriarchy and others will talk about rape culture and still others about reproductive rights. But the core of it is indisputably the fight for the recognition of inherent equality. And a lot of these movements, not just feminism, but many social movements, will adopt an image or a symbol to represent them. And one such symbol for feminism is Rosie the Riveter. So this is Rosie the Riveter. She was developed as a part of the Women in War Jobs campaign in the 1940s. Um, this was a World War II propaganda campaign to fill in jobs left behind by men as they left for war. And a riveter is um, an operator of a riveting gun, which is a manufacturing tool um, for the manufacturing industry, which is important during that time period. Uh, and Rosie, she was everywhere. She was in songs and magazines and posters and paintings. And there was even a movie made by featuring a real working woman named Rosalind or Rosie. This Rosie was not actually a Rosie to start with. This was a face of a workplace efficiency campaign in 1944. Um, it was displayed only for like a month or something like that and was rediscovered as a Rosie and reassigned that later in history because of her strong image and outspoken motto. Rosie wasn't originally developed as a feminist icon. She was propaganda. But what she did in the 40s was force women to be accepted in the working like, class and give them a taste of economic independence. And so when the men returned from war and took those jobs back, women took that as a challenge to regain the independence that they'd been granted for such a short amount of time. This challenged attitude was one of the greatest proponents of second wave feminism, which is a movement that ended up bringing to light issues like domestic violence and marital rape and reproductive rights, women in the household, and of course, women in the workplace. Even though Rosie wasn't supposed to be feminist to start with, what she did for feminism was undeniable. In the 1940s, Rosie allowed women into the job industry by telling them that their gender couldn't keep them out. And today, Rosie continues to tell women that they should not be left out of anything because of their gender, and in fact, should be proud of it. So recently, I was involved in a public debate about what Rosie means and about what's an appropriate use for Rosie. I believed that Rosie is a woman allowing women to speak about matters of their own on their own. So she's a woman with a voice of a woman talking about things for women. And the nature of the debate was a male, a man, 
trying to use Rosie to speak over the voices of women about things regarding women that women could talk about themselves. <laughs> Rosie is an image of balance, and this was turning that balance upside down. Um, I thought that it was taking an icon that I found, like, I treasure Rosie very much, and I felt like she was being unfairly stepped on, essentially, and her image was being tarnished. So I also felt kind of silenced, because like, my voice was being spoken over by the only, like, through a channel that was supposed to provide it. And I looked around to my classmates and peers, and I realized that I wasn't the only one. So with this knowledge, I went out and looked for a way to return the voice of Rosie to the voices of feminists that can speak for themselves. Um, I thought back to Candy Cigarette and photo essays and photojournalism photo that I'd seen in the past, um, and thought about how art has incited change and how good photography is at capturing the world as is to show what is wrong, but also what is right. And so I took my camera, I came up with a few questions, and I went to talk to my peers. And the insight that I got was pretty rad Feminism matters to me because I refuse to believe that womanhood must be defined by traditional standards of femininity. To me, feminism means being proud of being female and wanting to be treated not as greater than men, but rather as an equal. Feminism is for everyone. Regardless of who you are and whatever issues may affect you, you cannot deny the amazing progress it has made and is still making in shaping this world to be a just place. Who would not want that? For me, Rosie the Riveter is a reminder that the struggle for equality is not a new one. She's a reminder of how strong women of the past have been in refusing others' expectations of how they should behave. She's a reminder of how far gender equality has come and how far we still have to go. To me, Rosie the Riveter is a sign of power and equality. Even though she was originally used as wartime propaganda, she has come to mean so much more. She has stood as a symbol of the power of women for multiple generations, and now it's our turn. So photography is a way that you can capture and freeze time, but at the same time, it managed to effectively encourage flux and change and progress. Um, the use of photography in this project was to show real women speaking about issues that affect them every day. Um, photography gives us a channel through which we can make our own history and to tell our own stories. And this project, The Meaning of Rosie, helped me in restoring the feminist voice to 56 or 58 very strong women. And now it's your turn. I challenge you all to take a camera, pick up a camera and take a photograph of yourself and tell me what feminism is in your life, or better yet, talk about other things. Talk about things that matter to you individually, imbalances that you see in the world and that you seek to remedy. By showing these imbalances to the world, you are giving yourself a voice. To me, feminism means having a voice. The end. Thank you.